Hello, history scholars. Mrs. Olson here. Today's lesson is titled Imperialism in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Your learning target reads that you will be able to understand how Asians, we're going to talk about three different groups, how Asians responded to attempts to colonize them. And I'm using the term colonize somewhat interchangeably within the actions that imperialist countries were taking. Okay, so now is a good time to open up another window with, say, a Word document in there so that you can record uh, notes. Or, of course, you can have a regular piece of paper and a pen or a pencil handy to record those notes. Taking notes is always a good idea. It helps our brains to remember what it is that we are learning. And it also is a good tool to use on the lesson questions. All right, so here we go with the first slide. And I wanna talk about the background of Vietnam just a little bit. Well, from the mid 1800s anyway. This first note reads that France invaded Vietnam in 1858. So we're smack dab in the middle of the imperialist era, okay, in 1858. You should be asking yourself why? Why did France even care about this area of the world in Vietnam? Well, with many imperialist countries, they're looking to exert uh, control and influence in new areas of the world. And a lot of it has to do with making money. So influence and markets in Southeast Asia. Now markets, it isn't necessarily that the French are looking to buy things in Vietnam, more so to sell what it is that they are manufacturing so that they can make money that way. Okay, this note reads that v the Vietnamese couldn't withstand superior firepower, uh, European firepower. They just couldn't match the technology of France. You have this underdeveloped nation versus a developed imperialist nation, and France won. So what do they get out of it? Well, they actually get three countries, and those countries are Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, and all of this area is considered French Indochina at the time. Okay, so what I'd like to do is show you some pictures of French influence in Vietnam, which is still present today. Okay, so this first picture is um, uh, very Catholic and very French, and it is a replica, really, a real-life replica of Notre Dame, the real Notre Dame in France. And so it says it is the Saigon Notre Dame Cathedral in Ho Chi Minh City, which is the capital city, so here's a more of a history lesson. In the old days, it was called Saigon. Today, it is called Ho Chi Minh City, and it was renamed that after the Vietnam War, okay? So here's another one, and you can tell this is that this is a big, grand building. Do, 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 do. Sorry, guys. And it is titled the Reunification Palace in Ho Chi Minh City, okay? And... French baguettes, very popular in Vietnam, and that's because of the French culinary influence. And down here we have um, in France, or excuse me, in Vietnam, uh, a lot of boulevards that are wide in their structure and in their space, and then the boulevards are lined with trees, very much like you would see in uh, the larger cities in France. Okay. All right, continuing on, um, we've got our next country, which is uh, Thailand. So back in the day, it was called Siam. And we want to remember that this is the region that France controlled in the 1800s. And so it's called French Indochina. Um, and Thailand was part of this. So it's located between Burma, which the British controlled at the time, and the rest of the Indochine region. So Siam, as you can see on the map, is rather large, okay, and then this gray part is Vietnam. Okay, so that gives you um, context as far as where 
uh, Siam slash Thailand is located in the French Indochina region. Okay, and then I wanted to show you another map. Um, this one is more of a modern map, and you can see that uh, Siam is Thailand. They've given you both names for it. So it's yellow on this map, and then here is Vietnam in purple. Okay. All right, so there's our geography for the day. Now, I want to talk about a very famous king of Siam named King Mong Kut. So I gave you the phonetic spelling here, Mong Kut. Um, he ruled from 1851 to 1868. Now, who's quick at calculating how many years is this? Da, 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 da. If you said 17 years and 0 0.3 seconds, you win the prize. Now, a little bit about King Mongkut. Um, he was a Buddhist monk before he ascended the throne. And as a monk, he pursued a Western education, studying languages and sciences. Okay, you might say that he, uh, he impressed European leaders with his command of English because not all of the Asian leaders that they uh, took over and controlled could actually converse with them. A lot of them had translators, but not King Mongkut, which actually uh, helped him in the long run. Um, so there it is. He studied foreign languages and read widely on modern science and math. And what this did is um, when he came to power, he actually was able to modernize Siam. Now, in some ways, you might say that he saw the writing on the wall. Instead of pushing against Western powers in his country, he tried to give them a little bit of what they wanted so that they were more willing to work with him and not completely take over. I'm going to move this just for a moment, okay, and we have one more note on this slide, and uh, it says that this tactic allowed Siam to escape from becoming a European colony. So while they didn't have the ultimate 100% control over what happened with their country, there wasn't this complete takeover of Thailand slash Siam at this time either. Okay, so here is King Mong Kut, and this is his son. We're going to talk about him in just a moment. So um, if anybody's into Hollywood and movies and theater, King Mong Kut is actually the same king in The King and I. So in the 1950s, there were two versions of this story slash version of, sorry, uh, two versions of this story slash movie that were made. And then uh, I think it was in the 90s, maybe in the 2000s. I don't remember exactly. There was another version of it made, um, and it was titled Anna and I. And so it has to do with um, this English woman who goes there to teach, and she and King Mongkut um, become friends, essentially. Okay, so more on Siam. Uh, King Mongkut and his son, King Chula Longhorn, trying really hard at these names, and I did look up the phonetic spellings, uh, set Siam on the road to modernization. They actually say that his son was a better uh, speaker of English than he was, but he was still pretty darn good. Okay, this note reads that they reformed the government, they modernized the army, they hired Western experts to teach their peoples how to use new Western technology. So it wasn't just the elite and government officials that understood the sciences. They did push education and training and technology for um, as opportunities for all people of Siam to learn. Okay, and they're also known to have abolished slavery in, um, in Siam, which of course is a good thing, and it shows the Western powers that they are willing to uh, kind of progress and become part of this Western world, 
and um, they also gave women some choice in marriage. So the women of Siam did not have um, full say on who it is that they would marry, but these two leaders of Siam in the 1800s gave them a little bit more choice than uh, they were historically known to have. Okay, ladies, you got to be thankful that you are a female living in the 2000s in the United States of America, where we have a lot of choice. Okay, moving on. Ah, we're going to switch to the United States and the Philippines. Now, we are still in the imperialist era, and the United States was indeed an imperialist nation. So a little background on the Philippines. Up until the 1800s, the Philippines had been a Spanish colony for over 300 years. I think it's actually 333. That's a long time, people. Okay, so our first note, the Philippines, you want to remember, was a Spanish colony. So I'm hoping that you guys are writing these things down. This is kind of where I start to put in some fillers. A little bit about me. Most of you probably don't know. I'm half Filipino. My mom's full Filipino. My dad's white. He's Caucasian. Um, and my mom's family is actually pretty tall for being Filipino. And they say that is because there is a lot of Spanish blood in that, uh, that Filipino line. So it's just a little tidbit on me. Okay, um, when the U.S. came on the scene in the 1800s, it looked at different areas to establish control. And this was for a variety of reasons. Naval bases, refueling stations, overseas markets to sell products, okay, and enter the Spanish-American War. Now, without talking about and studying the Spanish-American War at length, know that it occurred in 1898. It actually was a war on two fronts. One was Cuba and the other the Philippines. And if you had me in the eighth grade, you might re uh, remember studying the Spanish-American War. All right, so the Spanish, they lost to the new American Navy in the Philippines and... Da -da -da -da. Okay, there it is. American battleships destroyed the Spanish fleet in the Philippines. Um, and the other part of the story is that the Filipinos, the rebels, were, they couldn't wait to get these big powers out of their country. Okay, so they, the Filipino rebels, they declare independence from Spain when all of this is going down. They think that the United States is going to back them and that the United States is just going to leave. Well, they don't. We don't. <laughs> So I wanted to share these political cartoons with you. We're not going to study them at length, but you can see that this is Spain. It says so right here on her crown. These figures represent Cuba and the Philippines. And of course, she's got them by um, their clothing, trying to hold desperately on to them, okay? And here is this one. So you can tell that this is Uncle Sam from what he's wearing, the, uh, the gray hair right here. And it says the last blow. Spanish colonies, whack, 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 right? This says Spain up at the top trying to keep control. Um, these little pieces of wood, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Cuba, okay? So that gives you an idea of where we're at as far as uh, Spain and the United States in this era of imperialism. Okay. Do, 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 do. Put that over there. Okay. Um, here are a few more. So this says, notice the U.S. is requested to withdraw, and this is from Aguinaldo, and I'll talk about him in just a second. Here's that um, uh, boot from Uncle Sam stepping on the Philippines. Here's another Uncle Sam, and the big elephant that is pretty beat up is labeled with Philippine Islands. Okay, we get in the drift? All right, so... 
This one says that rebel leaders fought against the Spanish, and in return, the rebels think that the United States is going to recognize their independence and get out. Unfortunately, that didn't happen for the Filipinos. At the end of the Spanish-American War, the U.S. agrees to give 20 million bucks to the Spanish in control of the Philippines and actually some other areas of the world. So here we are with Puerto Rico is one of those areas. Guam is another, and of course, we just talked about the Philippines. So I'm going to leave it on this um, page for a couple of seconds so that you can look at it further. Okay. And this says that Filipino nationalists uh, renewed their struggle against a foreign power. Um, they didn't understand what American intentions were, and so they had to fight the Americans to get out of their country. So here's the, um, the rebel's name, if you will. He's very famous in the Philippines, and that is Emilio Aguinaldo. Okay. And in this war against the Americans, thousands of Americans die, actually on Philippine soil, and then hundreds of thousands of Filipinos died. And in the end, the Americans crushed this rebellion and stayed there for quite some time. There we go. So here are uh, two um, images of Aguinaldo, and you can tell that this is a painting, kind of a younger version of him, and him a little bit older. And we always have to try and understand not only the motivations, but the outcomes or the effects of these imperialist nations in other countries. And so, the United States wins, they stay in the Philippines, and what is the effect of this? Well, they set out to modernize the Philippines in areas of education, they improve health care, um, economic reforms that help both countries, they build dams, roads, railways, and ports. All of these help to modernize and bring the Philippines from an underdeveloped nation to one that can participate in kind of this, uh, this modern global world that we are, were a part of in the early 1900s. So the end of this is that the U.S. promises Filipinos this gradual transition from self-rule uh, to self-rule, excuse me, sometime in the future. Well, that future was quite a ways away, and it isn't until after World War II that the Philippines is allowed to be independent, and that happens in 1946. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the notes. I've got a couple of images to show you to help um, kind of reinforce these ideas that we've been talking about. And so here is one, and it says the Philippine field down there on the bottom in the field. The, um, the behinds of the, the horses or the donkeys, you can think of another inappropriate name for them, probably read Justice and Humanity. Again, we've got Uncle Sam, who represents the government, the army, the military of the United States holding the plow. And on the bottom, it says, breaking new ground. Uncle Sam, uh, having put his hand to the plow, cannot turn back. So once he's there, he's got to finish the job. All right, guys, hopefully all of that makes sense. It gives you an idea of how Asians responded to imperialism. Ask me questions if you have them. Um, bye.